Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a Thursday edition of the MSP Initiative Live. I almost had to think about that for a second. That just means the time's flying by. Uh, but thanks for joining, as usual. Uh, just do some general housekeeping, and then we'll get into uh, we'll get into it today. Uh, as for anyone that follows us, you can find us at mspinitiative.com. This session and every other session will be available in podcast and video format uh, on the website uh, or through your favorite podcatcher. Uh, some other things up uh, that are worth mentioning, uh, stay tuned for our giveaways that will start turning on shortly. Uh, we'll be announcing some up upcoming community block parties for later on in the year. And lastly, what's happening as we speak is the beginning of uh, the Channel Strong Tour. We were in Texas uh, a, few, a couple weeks back, we're coming into Western PA and Ohio uh, later on this month. So check it out if you're um, in Western PA, Ohio. And then the week after that is actually in kind of the Midwest, Chicago, Michigan, Indianapolis, Lexington, Nashville. Uh, head to this page, request an invite if you're an MSP, and we would love to see you there. Uh, so that is all of the general housekeeping stuff. Uh, uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring on Corey. Uh, Corey is from uh, GX Technologies, right? GXT? GXA. GXA. Got that. Yeah, that's right. right. You visited us. That's uh, right. A couple we weeks were, ago. Yeah. That's right. We were in Texas a few weeks back, a couple weeks back. G GXA was one of the very generous, um, you know, kind of hosters of that of the tour uh, coming into uh, into Dallas. We really appreciate that. And uh, it was actually a pretty cool, pretty cool day with pretty good weather, Corey. It was awesome. And it couldn't have, couldn't have been any better. It was uh, a lot of fun, too. Glad to have you guys out. Our parking lot hasn't looked so live in, in many of moons. Uh, had a lot of fun out there. Well, we made sure to leave it as in good condition as we saw it. So we did a good. Did, you guys did, did were fantastic. Good. Yeah, <laughs> like the setup and like just the way you guys rolled in, set up and we're ready to party and then cleaned it all up and we're off on your way. Off, you would have never even known, never, never even known. That's the best way to do it. We had a lot of great conversations. I think we had almost 50 people um, all in, uh, in the parking lot. It was pretty good, pretty good, you know, kind of jam session with uh, lots of good conversations. Some of those we're going to get into here, but um, just zooming back. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, GXA. Uh, and you know, what, you know, obviously you're out of Dallas, Texas is, is, you know, would love to know a little bit more about the company where, you know, who you generally service, what a typical size customer for you would look like, and then we'll get into some of the good tech stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We're GXA. We're based in Richardson, uh, been in business, uh, George and Alicia, the owners of the company have been in business for 16, 17 years. Um, I've worked with them going on 13, um, 13 years now. So we serve, you know, you kind of find yourself uh, over time. We never really targeted specific vertical markets, but over time we found that we have quite a few clients in some type of commercial real estate, um, manufacturing and nonprofits has just been our focus. So once you start to realize that you're like, oh, maybe I can continue to target those clients and uh, we know a little bit about them. We've gained some competency. So we just kept on and keep pushing that way. And um, fortunately, all of them actually did really well through COVID and everything. So we've been strong and kind of picked the right markets, I think, to help us, our business kind of uphold through through COVID. So our average client size, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy. We've got clients in the 700, 800 user range, but then... Um, also clients at 30 users. So found a way to support both sizes pretty effectively. A little bit of different business models when you've got 700 users uh, that you support on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, yeah, we found a way to kind of merge between the two pretty well. That's interesting. And what, what's your role over there at GXA? So like most MSPs, I'm sure, uh, many hats, but I came in as a senior engineer and now I'm the IT director, so I run our operations team. Um, still like to get my hands dirty, work on projects, and kind of be an escalation point for the team. But uh, running our operations is my day-to-day -day job. Awesome. And then, um, obviously, the company's grown. So how many people there? And then, you know, obviously, your journey, obviously, you know, as they've been adding people, you know, you shifted probably from 
you know, like you said, in the trenches to um, kind of trying to manage people, um, which comes with a whole bunch of questions attached coming. But uh, how many people are on the in the organization and then how many people are doing technical services style work? Yeah, so we have um, about 25 employees. Uh, 18 are kind of full technical. Uh, that includes some partners we we leverage with uh, some partners who are like full time GXA resources, but try to kind of leverage different time zones and stuff too. So, um, about eighteen people on the technical side. Got it. So that's that's a that's a good team. So, <clears throat> some of the <clears throat> some of the topics I'm going to bring up are age old topics. I would I would call them, but I, I would love to hear your angle on them. So. Let's talk about finding new people, finding good talent. I guess the yang to that ying is retaining people too, right? It's very competitive uh, marketplace out there, and and it's a little bit uh, you know weird still since COVID. Uh, how has that whole story been for you guys? What a journey, man! Um, you know the finding talent is is difficult right we've got a really strong team that we built and i think our team and kind of culture that we're building helps um bring new talent in right so that i think is a strength for us is that we've got a really good team and we get a lot of people involved in interview processes and stuff like that and try to um but retaining talent's difficult especially you know we are still a small business right margins are margins and you got to you got to be be able to turn a profit in a business as a kind of running a business. And uh, we have clients like Exxon Mobil and State Farm and, you know, all these big guys coming into the Metroplex and um, they have much deeper pockets at times, right? So being able to be creative with uh, kind of pay and how we bring people on and how we try to retain them has worked well for us, but you're always going to lose the some good people to uh, people with deeper pockets. So trying to be nimble, right? We could, we might be able to operate with a little smaller team than we've got, but um, having some flexibility and I, I think it's probably the best way that we've been able to manage is not relying on any one person too much and instead having a little bit of a little flexibility there. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, everybody seems to have this challenge. Um, are, is your team still working relatively remotely? Or are they are they coming back? Are they in the office now? How's that working out for you? Yeah, so we brought everybody back uh, in uh, July of this year, and it, with the exception, I do have some remote employees uh, outside of the Metroplex that um, we didn't didn't come back to the office. So some full time remote. Most of my service team is here locally. Um, you know, we're kind of like with everybody else we're hiring. I've got a ton of roles open right now. And, uh, uh you know, I've, you get for some interviews where people don't even want to, uh, I think my last interview was, Hey, can I work from uh, 9am to 3pm that I can't quite entertain, but I also get the, uh, people that want to be hundred percent remote. So, you know, that's still part of our, our process is figuring a way out to, have remote employees and do that effectively and so yeah 9 a.m to 3 p.m it's not even bank hours it's not even bank hours yeah so it's interesting yeah interviewing uh, people right now and hiring is very interesting people have and it's not necessarily a bad thing but uh, people have learned that uh balance you know the the balance is shifting and more on the employee's direction um and like I said, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. We just have to find a way to shift and and meet them somewhere in the middle, right? People want their home life and they want to work from home and all good things, but we still got a business to run and we've got to figure out a way out to to do it effectively. What's the weirdest answer you've ever had in an interview? I've had three interviews this week. I've got one immediately after this. I don't even know. I could probably tell you the weirdest answer this week but the one that like the the gentleman was very serious about uh wanting to work 9 a.m to 3 p.m and every other wednesday he didn't really want to work um because he was taking care of family and so lots of reasons but 
it was a full-time job for a senior engineer that basically wanted to work about 65 to 75 percent of the time <laughs> wow okay that's it's an interesting one i get everybody Very seriously you, but yeah i don't see i don't see how that's gonna work um do you you know so obviously everybody's been seeing the shift to you know the security conversation um if it's not getting better it's probably getting worse from a you know number of things happening out in the world that probably don't do good good for the <laughs> for the business user uh or the personal user for that matter um what's been your approach to tackle the conversation of security i know it's a big word uh i know a lot of it has dollars attached to it right because you know you could you can't do what you need to do now with the you know with the the price from five years ago i think but uh everybody seems to have a different approach to it what's what's been your answer what's been your uh, you know approach to solve it you know it's always shifting just like you're talking about even now so much we have a sister company makai infosec that does focuses pretty much uh, entirely on security and the audit and compliance world um and you're right that does come with uh, a different level of cost we try to be very transparent with our clients that it is it and security is a different ball game we have to have a different conversation we have to have different people in your company involved in these conversations because it takes a lot of buy-in to make some of those big shifts to be more secure the biggest thing is is not to give the clients a big a false sense of security right you can't just do it halfway or half measures uh, because exposure is exposure um, but you know from we've been able to keep our clients really well protected and haven't you know i'm feel like i jinx myself just bringing it up but haven't had any serious issues it's because we build standards right we have a a great dns filtering product we have antivirus that we use we have just all clients are very, set up very similar and with the structure and standards we go through certain levels of hardening with office 365 so we we do things to minimize risk but when it comes to actually talking about security uh, really involving our sister company and letting, trying to not impress that false sense of security, I think is probably been our most, the, the best way that we've leveraged that. Hmm. So how do you get end customers who couldn't care less about the security steps? They just want to do their job to actually follow the recommendations, right? I mean, everybody, you know, I'm sure the 800, I'm sure the answer might be different for the 800 man customer versus the 30. Uh, but it just seems like the problem, no matter how you tackle security is in between the chair and the keyboard. Yeah. That's the biggest problem. But they're also the peop the thing that are hardest to make a change, right? They, they just don't want to drive sometimes with what's happening. Yeah, so I, again, I think it's a lot of our clients that come in come in because of our standards right and so we just we don't really compromise on uh we use this dns filter and we have this antivirus we harden office 365 a certain way we do phishing tests these are just kind of built into our standard and that's our package this is how much our cost per month per endpoint is and um, it allows us to implement those tools and manage them and if clients don't you know we've turned away many clients that i think we we could have done halfway for a less cost, but it's important, especially for my service team to manage them. Uh, you know, I know everybody talks about it, but I think we've done a really good job of saying this is without falling too much in love with our service and making our service the main thing. Um, this is our box and we're gonna try to stay here because we know in the this is ultimately going to lead to br less breakdowns, less breaches. And if we can stay in this lane and we can follow this path, then you know, we'll, you're going to be much happier in the long run. Give me an example of a scenario where it was time to fire a customer, somebody who fell outside of the box to the point where there was just no getting them into the, into the box. They just wanted to be outside. Yeah. In fact, we're kind of going through that process with a client. Now we've done it several times, but you know, we have a, um, a client that we're kind of going through that and just have a conversation with them that we're kind of shifting in a different direction. We're going to not um, kind of renew their contract on an annual term. We'll, we'll let it go month to month. And here's some, 
you know, depending on how good of a client, here's some IT providers that can help you or, you know, in the area that are kind of smaller and more fit your niche, right? That you really want to just call when things break. And um, so we, uh, we actually do go through that conversation and ha are currently going through it with a client. Hmm. Uh are they surprised when you bring this up or by the time that this conversation happened, are they pretty much knowing what's happening? Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, it's like a, it's like breaking up and even the conversation is, is like breaking up with a, you know, a partner or something. So as much as you have had conversations that are leading to that way, when you finally sit down and have that final conversation that says, Hey, we're not renewing your contract. We're going to go month to month. And here's the penalties for staying. If you continue on and don't find another IT provider, cause we're not just going to drop anybody or stop supporting them, but here's the month to month and here's the cost of it. It always feels like that final breakup conversation that, uh, there's always a little surprise, I think. Yeah, I can I can imagine that. Um, how hard is it, you know, to keep your people trained on the newest thing? And how do you approach it? I know that's it's hard, right? Because you put people into their chair. You you need to get their billable hours out there, even though nobody you know tries to bill per hour anymore. But like you still have a cost per hour. Yeah. But yeah. like there's this deficiency sometimes where you know everybody's at a different level. And how do you keep people up to date on your team? You give me some ideas, man. <laughs> but really, like I've got a, a person onboarding right now. A new new employee started uh, yesterday, and it's really about making a very big focus on completing an onboarding program, like because it's so. Uh, and we haven't always done the best job at it, admittedly. So it's like trying to be very diligent about, okay, yes, I know that you're ready to start taking those calls and we need you to start taking those calls, but you've got to block this time out. And so that's for new, new team members. And then um, we partner with, a, with Dallas College. So a couple times a year, we'll get, they'll come in and do training, extremely disruptive. The team is frustrated through the process, but very happy at the end of it um, because they'll come in and spend three days doing training um, on like Mac or a security product or Microsoft. And so we try to do that about quarterly or every twice a year, uh, some type of training. And it's like a rip the bandaid approach off. It's not going to be fun. Nobody's going to be happy through the process, but in the long run, we're all going to appreciate the fact that we had the training. Yeah, I think it's something that a lot of people don't have a structure of standardization to. And at some point, it may not be right away, but down the line, it does come to bite. How hard that bite is, I guess everybody has a different answer for that. But I think part of the challenge of training is technology changes quickly, too. I mean, some stuff is like if you're very embedded into Microsoft, it's like 70 percent of it's pretty structured, right? And then obviously as things change, right, you, you need to keep up. But some of the new stuff is just wildly, you know, different than what people have been doing, right? So um, especially like, you know, it sounds like you have another, you know, sister company that does a lot of the security stuff. But like, because that kind of blends into the world, I, I find very few MSPs have the talent in-house to do things like threat hunting and active remediation to issues, right? They, they require outside vendors to help them do that. You're, you're, well, you're absolutely right. And we are, even our sister company kind of leverages outside uh, resources for some of that stuff because, um, you know, you find what you're good at right? And what you can kind of update and maintain, and then you leverage partners. That's one of the things I like about the community uh, that we work with. You're like you guys specific is that there's just certain things that um, just like I tell my clients to outsource it, right? You don't have to have the, um, it's really relying on uh, partnerships and uh, vendors and that we've built over time that can really help us fill the gap of some of that security things, because obviously, you know, the, sometimes the margins just aren't there. I can't hire two uh, people to do it in case that one person's out. And so, you know, sometimes the right answer is to leverage partnerships and relationships and, um, 
and then sometimes it's like you said microsoft sticking with a standard um over time and those same products as long as they continue to be effective uh stick with them so that your team can kind of build some uh competency and some expertise over time uh yeah 100 yeah. percent uh i actually just saw in my mailbox the other day that um uh Office 365 Business Premium or Microsoft 365 Business Premium, <laughs> I'm changing the name, uh, now includes uh, Defender for Business. I was like, oh, so you raised your price, but now you're actually giving up some stuff. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, this price change and the things going through with Microsoft, it's like I've, you've always joked or I've always joked about needing a PhD to keep up with licensing, and it doesn't seem to be changing at any, any time. But um, yeah, the you you brought up like technology always changing and microsoft being better than most right you know but even microsoft is trying to keep up with that and make sure that you're doing the best by your clients by leveraging especially they're already paying we got clients on e5 and e3 and every day it changes what's included in them and making sure that you're leveraging and getting the best cost out of it is is a challenge yeah i agree especially when um you know what is your opinion on the there's like two things that kind of happen like a double whammy one was obviously all the pricing changes nce all that jazz which is still kind of unwrapping itself it's not totally flushed out yet i think and then you know like not long after that all really finally hit you know microsoft's like hey we're kind of redoing our partner program and and now you need to like change the game because if you're not doing new customers then you may not be qualified as a microsoft partner i'm like that's a lot of organizations out there that i can think of that will absolutely be affected by that yeah i've actually got microsoft's doing a a co-op live round table or meeting next week i think like the 13th so i with all things microsoft i try to stay up top with it but kind of wait for the shoe to drop right we may have waited a little too long we were communicating things like the price increases in nc but you just didn't know what exactly was going on so it's it's like uh here's the warning but let me uh let me wait for the shoe to drop before we make any kind of shifts because you just never know but um yeah i think that once you're in bed with a a, a giant <laughs> you kind of just got to roll with the flow and they've fortunately done a really good bias i think it's a great product great solution to kind of build your business around small medium big um but you're kind of at their mercy you you don't get to just pick up the phone and say wait a second i don't want to i don't want to have my price increase just yet or i don't want to i don't want that product rolled out just yet you yeah just... they're in an interesting position where they can just do it and everybody else just has to feel the pain. Yeah. Um, how did, you know, <laughs> Dan, hold on, Darren pops in. Yeah. <laughs> says, in bed with a giant is okay until they roll over and crush you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Are you concerned that Microsoft is positioning themselves to do deal directly with the end user, bypassing people like you? Who are doing outside IT services? Is that a fear from your perspective? You know, I think that we have got to be prepared as an MSP for um, things like wh where businesses go almost exclusively cloud based and uh, have very little requirements on servers. And at some point, especially the small businesses, right? The 15 to 20 users or smaller uh, have no network infrastructure. 5G's rolling up all over the place here in Dallas. Um, like, I think you just got to be prepared that something like that's going to happen and really make the, the shift to uh, providing a particular service, right? Some things we do like um, no before training, or I don't mean to plug any products here, but training, phishing, testing, things like that. Like, those are some, you need some expertise, I think, in the long run to uh, parse out the data that you get from it, kind of make decisions on it. So, yeah, I think that in the long run, 
Microsoft dealing directly is going to probably take some of the smaller clients away. And if we're honest about it, they probably don't need it, right? They don't need some of my services in the long run. I don't, we're, I don't think we're there yet, but um, you just got to be ready to shift. You know, I think you just got to position yourself with the value and continue to provide value to clients. And if it's not for supporting their servers or then you find somewhere else to provide value. I get it. A lot of people are creating kind of like a, you know, business, you know, process automation or DevOps, stuff like that, right? They're kind of creating new things, uh, which is getting really interesting. And some people, uh, which, which kind of leads into my next question, uh, short of a, a bus pulling up into your parking lot, uh, which never happens, um, where do you, how do you keep up with new vendors entering the space, new service offerings, new products, right? It's, you know, Microsoft's its own animal. I kind of put them in their own category. And then there's everybody else, right? Uh, there's never enough time, but how do you guys try and keep up with that? Yeah, I mean, it's really about, uh, we haven't since, since COVID and even this year, we haven't really gone out to any events or anything like that. We've joined some virtual uh, conferences and things like that. And making time for that is important. Um, I, I rely on uh, at times salespeople to be a little relentless. <laughs> uh, and I've heard, you know, I see their name enough times or something catchy in my email and I'll, you know, entertain and have a conversation. Um, or it's just the right timing of a, a need that I have. And um, I've seen something in my email and that's how we kind of start following a path very intriguing you know you you follow uh <laughs> darren appreciate you coming back on there darren he says happy to send you a few in that category well i mean listen um there's a lot of forums groups all sorts of stuff out there and when you when you read some of them they're like i'll never i don't call me if i need something i'll call you delete don't answer don't call and i'm just like mm -hmm the world doesn't really work that way, guys. I'm sorry. Like you, like, how are you prospecting to get new customers? Because you must be something doing, do You must be doing it dramatically differently because otherwise that's how it's done. Right. Well, and that's it. I mean, I, I have no problem with it because there was last year, mid last year, I had a client that was asking about you know, uh, some software on their machine that would let them track everything. It's a healthcare client and they needed to know everything. They need to be able to pull a video. It's not something that I've ever done before. And like a divine intervention of some sort, I got an email that from a vendor who had been going back and looking, had been emailing me for months and months about their product. And, you know, the, with the whole tagline, this will be my final email. If I don't hear back from you, I think the last three or four emails had that exact same subject. And, uh, but I happened to get one from them right when I was trying to research some product and it ended up being a great, great partnership. I've rolled that their product to many of my healthcare clients and it's a new kind of line of business for us and brought a lot of value to my clients. So Awesome. Keep emailing. Uh, it's okay. It, it works, guys. For all those yeah. people in the sales and SDR seats out there, it works. But yeah, just don't, keep get, going. don't get totally demoralized. Um, a lot of no's for you get yeses. But there you go, Darren. It does work sometimes, but maybe yeah. not for the vendors you're talking about. <laughs> uh, but Dar Darren's a big Chick-fil-A fan. So, yeah, and yeah we, we, we trade Chick-fil-A stories and vendor stories back and forth. So, yeah was just there of course you yeah. were I, I haven't hit my daily visit yet but it's it's it'll come don't worry um let's talk about you know the 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 hybrid approach you know or even just the cloud approach like if you were to say of the hundred percent of the endpoints customers users um that you service how many of them are like totally in the cloud like virtual desktop, virtual servers, SaaS, everything to people who still have infrastructure that is not in the cloud somewhere that needs to be supported. Like what's the percentage look like? Yeah, so I have um, very few clients in a true like virtual desktop type of environment. Um, I have almost no clients that have infrastructure of their own still sitting around. They're in some form of a cloud, whether it's a private cloud environment that kind of GXA is built out and we own 
um, or Azure, AWS. Um, you know, the the thing that we found pretty early on when Azure became a thing and when we started to research building our own private cloud out is if you can move the conversation past the infrastructure, they don't care, right? If it's cloud-based and, you know, the I've heard a lot of people in big companies talking about they're really trying to roll back away from infrastructure and Azure and the cloud because the cost is just uh, skyrocketing. Um, so it's really about managing costs, doing the right thing by the business. Um, and you get the conversation away from what the infrastructure is and it's really about you know, what the value it's going to bring to them, um, then we've really had no objections to moving into a private cloud. But I don't have, I can't even think of one or two clients that have some form of infrastructure, like sitting in a server room at their office. Um, so lots of cloud, lots of cloud adoption, uh, kind of across the board. And trying to stay with those, trying to stay with the partners, not, you know, some random person that's doing QuickBooks cloud hosting that you don't know anything about, right, is just really trying to pick partners that have been around for a long time that's not going to bite us. Because if something happens, it's GXA regardless of what vendor it is or um, so trying to trying to stick with good partners. No, I totally get that. And it's so true. And there are a lot of those guys out there who just do the QuickBooks hosting. That's funny that you say yeah. that. Um, couple questions that I've asked recently to people who have been on like yourselves. Does the headlines in the mainstream news, right? I mean, yes, you know, in like our little circle, there was Kaseya, there was solar winds, but like, you know, there are practically every other day, this was hacked. This school system went down. This bank was affected. This local municipality had an issue, whatever, right? It seems like every day there's something. And that people are reading that, people are consuming that from the outside world. Is that helping your, your initiatives internally with your customers? Because now they're coming to you saying, ah, I don't want to be this guy. Take, you know, what do I got to do to not be this, right? Or does that complicate your conversation more? I mean, it's, it's a mixture of both. You have clients that, uh, I have clients that will see that stuff and are early risers. So I've got an email in my mailbox at four in the morning, like, what are you doing about this random attack that has nothing to do with, you know, my business, but, you know, so you have to spend the time responding and providing some assurances, but, um, you know, you, you do still have clients that um, don't always take it seriously or like, local admins on a computer right not everybody wants to sign a waiver and every ceo feels like they need to be an admin on their machine and can't put a ticket in and so you know i don't think necessarily the random uh headlines make a huge impact because we try to address them especially big security vulnerabilities i try to send some notification out to our clients about it but um i go hunting and picking for the the headlines that will serve my purpose at times that are like, look, this CEO was an admin on their computer and <laughs> did this. So I'm looking for some of the headlines that can help um, help us. But I think the big, the big news just keeps it important. And uh, like I said, we've got a lot of standards for our clients. We're already doing a lot of hardening and security stuff. Um, and so it just reinforces uh, and we do talk about it during VCIO meetings or something, especially if it's an industry where, uh, you know, they share infrastructure, or share the same types of technology. Um, but then we do have things like solar winds that happen where, you know, we partner with solar winds in certain ways. And so something like that happens and it's like your pants are on fire for the next week and just always got to be ready to respond and have the right resources in house to be able to respond quick. Because you don't want to be the next guy, you know. <laughs> you don't want to be the next guy or next MSP that has something happen to him. Yeah, I think uh, I you know for a while there, and and still definitely the case. You can't take your eye off the ball. I really feel like the MSP was targeted, right, by the bad guys. You know, because they have access to a lot of people underneath of them, and like if you can get into you know their side of the equation, then the, the kind of the castle opens for everything else. Um, I feel like there's still a education gap right where you know there's like an internal effort that needs to occur 
as well as trying to help your end customer too, right? Um, and some of that's just, you know, just like you're taking time out to do training, right? And you have the local college come in and do your thing. Like the MSP sometimes needs to stop and like take a look back at themselves. And I feel like sometimes that doesn't happen unless there's some sort of security issue that occurred internally or the cybersecurity renewal came and all of a sudden has a lot of extra pages with a lot of hard questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's one thing about our sister company that I enjoy about not doing security ourselves is because um, our sister company audits GXA. We are a client of them. They're doing vulnerability penetration testing. We sit down and do our, our, uh, monthly and quarterly meetings like we would do with any other client. So, um, and then we, you know, I think that there's a certain amount of cost that comes with having some, somebody outside do an audit of the environment, especially when you have a private cloud and you're building something like that is, is let somebody else try to break it, you know, give them an opportunity to try to break it, try to get in. Um, and don't be blindsided by risk or think that, you know, Oh, uh, you know, we built this well at the time and, you know, five years ago, everything, you can just set it and forget it. Um, you know, constantly assume that you are vulnerable and something is not set up correctly and let people try to break it and constantly try to fix it. Cause you can't get complacent. Complacence is like the enemy of everything in my opinion, right? You got to be hungry. You got to keep trying to grow. You got to want to learn and you got to assume your risk. <laughs> you know, you're at some level of risk and uh, something needs to be fixed. So as long as you stay on that route, you won't get, I don't think you're going to at least get blindsided by too much. And I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow a phrase when we uh, when we're done this session, uh, but that was good. Um, so 5G is it the fake 5G or is it the real 5G? Because like everybody's supposed to be saying 5G, but I'm not sure yeah. I saw a difference. Yeah, no, there's there is some legitimate 5G. at and is rolling out some pretty uh, like downtown. You can uh, if you got a, the mobile devices that support 5G, I can I can be places in downtown Market Center and you know be downloading at 200 meg down and up a couple of milliseconds of latency so it's 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 there you know it's just my phone will say it when i'm here in richardson and it's the fake 5g right but you it's parts of downtown dallas i think it's it's getting there all right have you tried have you played with starlink yet uh, no, I was hearing somebody actually at the somebody at our event that you guys hosted for us had talked about uh, a local MSP here talked about it being part of their R and D budget. Unfortunately, uh, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to sneak that in and see what George and Alicia say and and get something here. You know, I had a client that moved offices recently and they're still waiting on a fiber build out, and so they had kind of cheap spectrum internet, and of course with that. Murphy's Law, you're, we're down to just one internet connection. They've had some outages that were pretty impactful, bad timing. And uh, it's, it's times like that where I'm like, man, what if I just had it? What if, what if I could have just sent somebody down? Would it have worked? So we're, we're definitely going to do some testing and see if that was, is a possibility of bringing some a client back online pretty quick. Yeah, it's interesting. Speaking about that, I just saw in my feed, at and just dumped Time Warner uh, business, um, which includes their telecom and their internet. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I thought these guys are all rolling up and now they're splitting up. Yeah. How about them apples? There are wow. so many people. I, you know, it's another place where I've, I've got a partner that I love um, for finding, I, finding the best internet provider and kind of managing that process for us. So trying to go to at and directly and time warner and who's the best and what the best cost is it's just another thing i just don't have time for and um so we got a great partner that we work with that kind of manages that thankfully yeah i had a I had a partner the other day come out to us and say hey, i have this end customer they have this toll-free number but they don't have a they never got they never get billed for it so how like we can't port it because there's no bill and i'm like huh free toll-free service hmm, okay <laughs> I was like, well, well, guess what? I found out where that number was. It was an AT&T. They're like, oh. I'm like, but that's a big word. 
<laughs> yeah. You know, one 800 at t may not get you anywhere very fast, but uh, yeah, you probably start updating business cards and websites now. You're never getting yeah. that number ported. Yeah, well, I don't know. I told I said I I got I got him to the starting point, but I, told, I said it's gonna take a while. You'll eventually yeah. get the information you need. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the big guys are always interesting, especially the cable companies and the internet companies. I mean, yeah, it's very, very interesting. How about this? Kaseya, I know that's a dangerous word for people like Darren. Kaseya is terminating support for Kaspersky antivirus since they've now been on the you know, please don't use company because they're from Russia list, uh, I assume. Yeah. Um, that's interesting that they were the first ones to come out and say that. But I guess, you know, given their situation, better to be proactive than reactive at this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, look, this is a hot button topic, I'm sure. And but uh, you don't want to be the you don't want to be the one that people start protesting about, right? Keep your nose clean. If I, I guess we're kind of a smaller, uh, a smaller focus, right? MSPs are, we're not like making the news. It's not some, um, but you don't want people protesting. You don't want your name getting out there in some bad, not all, not all media is good media or what is that saying? So um, yeah, it's yeah, better I to just, yeah. <laughs> Darren says, are two companies that happen to start with the same two first letters really that different? I don't know, Darren. We'll leave that out for the for the, the masses to think about. Yeah. Uh, good good thought there, pal. I appreciate your uh your your in you know your intrigue as usual. Um what you know, are you still seeing? I, I think the answer is yes, but I'll, I'll you know. Are you still seeing a delay in being able to get stuff to show up? Uh, because, you know, like I just think about the regular, hey, life cycle and keeping people not on really old stuff and keeping people on, you know, kind of supported things. And then you just can't get it. I mean, it seems like it's backed up for months. Yeah, our hardest time was uh, product getting product in is still difficult. It's getting better, but um the hardest thing we had to shift was, you know, we have clients that we try to build out a roadmap, try to build out budgeting, and we would put a quote together and vendors would honor it. You never had a problem with, you know, a quote being 30 days old, and I could always reach out to the vendor and say, hey, I want to renew this and not worry about it being too much different. But that, this changed everything. Like, I got to put disclaimers on my quotes that they're only valid for like three days now you, you got to approve them. three days yeah because buying things like the price can change the product in stock or not in stock i need you to sign off on this right now so i can go out and buy it it was it's been kind of crazy i mean for everybody but i think it's just shifted the way that we uh, you know i'm not guaranteeing the cost of anything um because you just don't know wow 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 I've heard of people saying, hey, you know, after day 30, you know, they went back on day 31, the price was different, sometimes really different, like 20% different in the in the bad direction. But three days, that's... Well, and the problem is, is that if the availability, right, the cost may be able to be okay, but if a client needs something in a short period of time, and I have to go out and shop it with another vendor, right? I need to get this in just a couple of weeks or something in, and so now... That's why? Yeah. Yeah. Just run up the store. You know, our yeah. fries all closed down, which was disappointing. You, you guys ever have fries or anything up there? Yeah, no, I, I, I've been in a fries, but out here in the Northeast, I'm here in Philly area. Yeah. They never made it out this way. Kind of like in and out and Whataburger and the rest of the good stuff you guys have down there. Never made it up here, but uh, yeah. Fry, what I, I mean, it's a shame. Cause like the last man standings, like, Best Buy and the regional guy. I mean, there's like, there's no, you know, there used to be a bunch of electronic stores that are all gone now. I guess Amazon killed them. Yeah. Do you guys have micro centers out there? Oh yeah. Micro yeah. Center that's, a, that's a, all right. We've got, we, that's our kind of go-to after fries closed. If you have to pick something up, they've, they've got stuff, but it wasn't quite like fries. Yeah. The fries was great. I guess, you know, we're, yeah, and they, had, they had a lot of locations too. It's a shame. Yeah. They were right down the street from us. So it really was pretty convenient. Uh, go and grab something last minute head on site so uh felt fortunate we had them while we did but a day's passed away 
reminds yeah. me of the, remember like tiger direct and circuit city and all those guys back in the mid 2000s and they're all gone yeah, they're all just yeah gone. we still have a new egg around here but it's it's just a storefront uh, it's you have like a, new a egg, you have a new egg storefront it, there is a new egg storefront but it's just like a they don't carry much product they don't they don't carry much you but they do wow. have a new egg is it soon are you soon you're going to be going to the amazon uh, retail store yeah yeah could you imagine um well i mean that that takes up that takes things to a whole new level hey i just bought this computer can you set it up for me yeah uh, Amazon no, just <laughs> delivered it by a drone. The Amazon's drone dropped a computer off of my doorstep. You hear they're doing that here in Frisco. I don't know if they've done it oh, everywhere else. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They're, they're, they actually are doing that. I heard that was like, uh, like, hey, we got approved, but then nothing ever came from it. Yeah, so it's not Amazon. I don't think uh, maybe it's Amazon, but Frisco, like starting this week or this week or next week, they're actually delivering things like from Walgreens, Best Buy, our uh, Bluebell ice cream first aid kits like they got dog for animal prescriptions and stuff but yeah they're actually doing drone delivery wow 20 have minutes you tried, from here. have you tried it yourself it's not in a, it's not in my neighborhood yet but i certainly will just for the interest factor of watching a drone i, I totally want to see that i want to get my yeah. my pizza delivered by drone absolutely i will do it 100 percent yeah darren have you gotten drone delivery yet buddy he's like hey they're already starting this in many places news to me I didn't hear about that. Yeah. Not yet, he says. Exactly. It's all a myth. Yeah. Uh, uh, Brent comes in here and says, Best Buy is actually pretty well stocked. Yeah, they're the only people that have all the inventory. Yep. Nobody else has stuff at Best Buy. And it's probably the stuff they bought two years ago that just finally showed up. Smoke and pepperoni. I like that, Brent. Pepperoni is my yeah. friend. Um. <laughs> How, so so how do how do you handle that now actually right like everybody's changing their phone every two days everybody goes to the store and buys the next shiniest thing it's amazon black friday in july whatever it is i mean a lot of people just buy more screens and then like what's how, how do you handle that from a hey we're going to support everything with a blinking light i don't think that works yeah i mean fortunately that a lot of our clients i am uh, I don't have a ton of mom and pop shops that would just go out and, and, uh, buy their own equipment. Right. So they do come to us. We've kind of built relationships through our, uh, virtual IT managers, our virtual CIOs have, so not many of my clients would go out and just, you know, sign up for Dropbox or, uh, I go buy, you know, monitors off of Amazon and have them delivered. But, um, you know, if they do, we help them resell them <laughs> while we get the standards in. It's like, hey, there's a market like, out there. For like, hey, there's this thing called eBay. Let me just put yep. that over here. Yeah, we uh, will definitely help. Funny enough, here is the link from uh, from uh, Darren. Google starts full drone, full scale drone delivery to residential homes in Dallas. Wow. Yeah, it actually happened this week. It's it's going on this week, I think. And uh, they made sure to highlight that your bluebell ice cream would show up still frozen. Wing, somewhere a in company there. owned by Google. I don't know if I, I like that or I don't, but. Does it surprise you? Yeah, yeah, seriously. Uh, but Thursday, to... April 7th. So I'm sure there's going to be, if I look on my local news channels tonight, there is going to be videos of these guys delivering product that started today. Wow. That is in, I want to, I wonder what the going rate for a drone delivery fly person is, pilot. It's crazy right i mean they literally show looks like they show up with here with a, a shipping container and they just start flying people their stuff instead of the truck nuts yeah well it's one one thing's for sure the, the stuff that like remember what remember back in the day when it was like minority report like oh this is so cool and like all that and like 90 yeah. percent of the tech in that movie's out yeah, are you going to do any, are you going to be the first to hop on a flying Uber drone when they come out? I, I might let Darren do it first. <laughs> you know, yeah. let, let, let somebody else try it before I do. I don't I'm not, I'm not a hundred, like, you know, I would, I, I, if, if, if Knight Rider was real, I would prefer that before yeah. I would get into the flying. Drone. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm not quite. I don't know that I'm brave enough for that. Anything that can just come to me and I get to check it out, no problem, right? But you're going to put me into a, a flying car. I'm not quite sure I'm there. <laughs> Brent says, I will, while having a beer with my B-Voy mug. Hey, there's <laughs> going to be B-Voy beer with that B-Voy mug. There's more of yeah. those coming around, pal. <laughs> don't worry. Those, those are a hot collectible. Uh, actually, we ran out at your place. We didn't have enough for everyone. That was the last day of uh, the week. I did get one though. I did, Dude, I did get one. Yeah. It's good. They, they, they're hard to come by. I got to buy them in bulk. I'll tell you what, you guys left over so much soda and uh, beer and everything. Cause we were your last stop. So you basically dumped your coolers out in my, it was, it's all I gone, mean, man. Your, your, yeah. your office guru was like, we'll take it all. I was like, okay, sure. And then yeah. like, we, we hooked you guys up for a while. huh? Yeah, it was awesome. There was, you know, I'm a little concerned about how much bang energy my guys consume, but it was all like. <laughs> I know exactly who bought the bang energy too. I'll yeah. have to remind them about that. That stuff was gone way too quick. I'm a little worried about the, the energy or the caffeine intake of my team, but hey, whatever keeps them going, right? <laughs> yeah. Next thing you know, you're going to be handing everyone one of those uh, smart health things, all right, that monitor your stuff. You're like, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, put the bang down. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, no, I'm glad to see you guys actually benefited from that because you know that probably would have ended up in the trash, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, you know, we like to reduce reuse recycle around here, and uh, yeah, I think we, I think that's good. I feel better about that now. I have to tell everybody from the from the bus that all of the the snacks and the and the soda were used well. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't leave the beer in the fridge, unfortunately. That got that got taken home that night. I'm sure the team would have appreciated that, but we, uh, yeah, that didn't get left behind. I don't think it'd be any leftover of that either if we left it. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, listen, that means that we left you with we left you with enough ammunition to do multiple outside channels. You had a nice little patio at back too. It was a pretty nice yeah. spot. Yeah, it is a pretty nice spot. And, and I, like I said, I, it was awesome that you guys came in. It gave us some ideas of what we can do out there too because we hadn't really used the the parking lot like that in the past. So uh, we got plenty of pop-up tents and guys got cornhole they can bring. So we'll find a yeah. way to keep ourselves. It does help that the owner of the building is also the owner of the company. Yes. Yeah, we, yeah. Get, our, we get to kind of do what we want. Yeah, that that definitely we've run into some interesting property managers and like crazy loopholes and things that we had to do. And it's like, no, you have to do this and you have to have exactly 10 cones. And I'm like, okay, how about 11, 12, 15? No, just 10. Okay, no problem. So uh, but no, hey, you have a good asset there in that parking lot. And you know what? I'm, I'm literally just got invited on a panel to talk about getting out from behind the screen and like back to in person sales and networking and that kind of thing and like that's a perfect thing for you guys right you know like it doesn't need to be expensive it just you need to do a little bit of planning and a little bit of inviting but man the in-person does so much more to everything than this unfortunately yeah i agree yeah, yeah. it's a big word we're, we're missing a big part of what what we had in the past but we didn't even know it until now you know two years in of sitting behind these screens talking to people then you kind of know you're missing it now. Yeah, hundred percent. Which, but one thing is for sure, and and you know, you having been, you know, you were probably there before you kind of moved up and other people came in. But you can't like those on call days and like those days where you had to like do the the night weekend rotation thing and all that. Who knows what you're doing now? But you're not. You're surely not tied to a desk anymore like you used to be, right? Like you could yeah. pretty much be anywhere and take care of it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and also the, the skill set that I'm trying to bring in house, right. That's uh, I don't have to, I don't have to narrow my search down. Although there's great candidates in Dallas, it's a hot market, lots of talented people. But if I, you know, sometimes it's also the market here and salaries are through the roof. I, I've got some options. And so it's, it's also expanded my business in ways that I didn't really think possible before. And it kind of made you think outside the box. It's like, well, Maybe I can go to that other market and hire somebody. And so it's I mean, opened some opportunities up. You should, you should do it. What everybody does now. You, you take the map and instead of looking for salaries per area, you look at the gas price. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You feel like, well, the gas price is this. So it's cheaper than this. Like I'm going to give you like a hookup here. We'll give you some, <laughs> some gas as part of the deal. Yeah. Give you a gas card, a monthly gas card. 
There you go. And yeah, yeah. like we'll, we'll send everybody gift cards out every month and then, you know, go to your favorite gas place. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I will tell you the one that everybody loves on the road is Bucky's. It's like, yeah. the, like the favorite spot on, on the, you know, on the tour stop. Yeah. It's just like, that's on my way to my daughter's softball practice three times a week. So we're, it's like, we stop at Bucky's all the time. It's, it's insane in the middle of nowhere, even where we go. 120 pumps and you can't find a park you can't find a pump to get gas at right and it's like it's insane it's like the a places, football field yeah maybe two it is like a they it's a cult following but it's it's pretty awesome it's a pretty cool store brent says where's my gas card 140 dollars yeah. to fill up the tundra wow. i know i know i just went through it like i yeah i switched from a car to a truck about a year ago and uh man i wish i could go back <laughs> but, yeah i and i i find it hard fought that the answer is we'll just go get an electric one like did you have you looked at the cost of the electric equivalent of what you have recently it's not the same it's like this yeah it's like doing yeah. solar panels on my roof it's just uh, not quite there yet right my, my the cost is the, you're gonna pay for it one way or another so he says i want a rivy van what's a rivy van R I V I V R I. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I'll have to Google that, figure out what that is. All right, Brent, you might be on to something new here, buddy. Uh, okay. All right. Well, listen. Hope everybody finishes out all those those drinks and snacks. Yeah. Again, thank you. Pre, please tell uh, George and Alicia thank you again for letting us, you know, roll into the parking lot. I, re- I think she really enjoyed that uh, race car that we brought. Oh yeah, it was awesome. Neighbors didn't like it, but <laughs> yeah, I think I heard a few few of those. But yeah. uh, hey, it was only for a few hours. No, okay. it was awesome. Yeah, and you know you had a good time when the neighbor starts complaining. Oh yeah, it's a Friday. It's not yeah, even it like fun. it's like in the middle of the afternoon. What do you What do you do at home? Well, yeah. like, <laughs> okay, um, but we'll we'll definitely be back in Texas. We 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 can't wait to you know connect with you guys again. Maybe just maybe you guys might pop out to an event sometime Absolutely. later on this year. Now that for sure, keep us in the loop. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll for sure. Come. All right. Well, thank you very much, Corey. This session, everyone, was recorded. Like I said in the beginning, it's available on MSPinitiative.com under sessions. You also see that on, uh, you know, we have a podcatcher out there for for podcast for the podcatcher. So uh, definitely go back and rewatch this one. This was great. Uh, Corey, Corey and company have a great operation going on down there. You might want to pick his brain. So maybe find Corey online. I'm sure he's on LinkedIn. Or yep. Facebook. LinkedIn. Hit me up. Yep. LinkedIn. Not Snapchat. No. Not, on Snapchat. <laughs> Not yet. We don't have the GXA Snapchat going just yet. But, but you know, go go look at Corey from GXA on LinkedIn. If you got questions, shoot him a message. Sounds like he loves messages, unlike Darren. Darren <laughs> hits delete. Don't spam me, man. Yeah. All good. Appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone. Catch you on the next one. Thanks, everyone. Bye.